Appreciate those kind words. It's good to be back with you again today. Pat and I enjoy coming here to Bible Baptist Church. Y'all always make us feel welcome, and we appreciate it. And thank you so much for, I appreciate your pastor inviting me to be with you today in his absence. As I was teasing the other day, I said, one thing about it, when you invite me to speak in your absence, they appreciate you more when you get back in. So, uh, but y'all are very blessed to have a pastor like you do. He's a wonderful man. But, uh, but thank you again. I appreciate David and Brother Stump taking care of the music and everything. Thank you, Sandra. I appreciate you playing. Your music adds a lot to the service. But it is good to be out quick. I appreciate it. Any of you have trouble remembering anything? Pat and I are getting to that stage that we do. You, you go to, you think about something, you go into a room to do it, and you get there and you can't remember what you're supposed to do. You ever get there? And you try to remember, can I do anything else while I'm here so I won't have to come back? Well, it's not quite as bad as I heard of one couple. This couple, they were watching television in the living room, and the man said, I'm going in the kitchen and get me a, a, some ice cream. He asked his wife, said, do you want me to get you anything? She said, yeah, bring me a Coke. Well, he was gone for a long period of time. When he comes back, he has eggs and bacon. She looks at it, and she says, where's the toast? So you can see what I'm talking about. We are members. We have a short member, but I really appreciate you allowing me to be with you this morning. Let's go to Mark chapter 13. I'll start reading with verse 31, but while you're turning there, let me give you a little background to this chapter. They've been in the temple, and they've left the temple. Now he and his disciples on the Mount of Olives... And three of his disciples came to Christ and asked him, said, tell us what's going to happen in the future. What's coming on? And so here he starts teaching them about what's going to come in the future. And one of the ways that Christ always taught, he used parables. That's the way he takes something of an earthly meaning and make it a spiritual meaning. And so he used that over and over. And that's what he's doing today. But I want to start reading the first 32, but of that day and that hour knoweth no man, know not the angels in, which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave his authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye knoweth not when the master of the house cometh, even at midnight, or at the uh, crowing, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for your amazing love and goodness to us. And we're so thankful that you loved us enough that you sent your Son from heaven's glory took upon him a human body and died on that old rugged cross and shed that precious divine blood to pay the sin debt that we could not pay. And we're so thankful it was paid in full when he came forth the third day we knew it was. Now, Father, we thank you, amazing grace. You promised to be with us regardless of the circumstances of whatever we go through. And, Father, we're so thankful that you care for us. Now, I don't know the people's heart here today. I don't know what they're going through in their life. But I know that you care for them. And may, I, may each one here may not be discouraged. If they have things going in their life, may they realize you're still on the throne. You're still in control. And that you can handle anything in a person's life. Make it real to them. Now, Father, we thank you for the song service so far, for the prayers been offered up. Now, Father, may I be an instrument in your hand. May I present your word in such a way that the Holy Spirit can touch hearts and lives. Father, just have your way here today. Just guide and direct again that we thank for this church and this testimony. We thank for the pastor and his family. And we pray that you continue to bless them. May this church always be a lighthouse for you. Where people can come to know you as their personal Savior. 
and grow in the grace of God. Again, thank you for loving us. You've been so good to us. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Aren't you glad that you have a Savior, you have a God that you serve that has the power to keep his promise? We as human beings, sometimes we make a promise, but we can't keep it. A lot of times something comes up. But I'm so thankful that God that I serve has power when he makes you a promise, he keeps that promise. Aren't you glad of that? And hasn't he made some great promises for the Christian today? He said he's going to be with you regardless of the circumstances. He said, I'm not going to allow anything to come in your life that you can't handle. But one of the greatest promises is that he has promised to come back. He has promised to come back to earth. And we have, there are two phases to his second coming. I'm sure you're familiar with it. First phase is when he comes in the air. He calls the church up. When I say the church, not the church building, but the people that have been saved by the grace of God in a period of grace. He calls them up with what we call the church. Meet him in the air and we'll go with be with the Lord forever. The second phase is when he comes back to this earth and sets up his kingdom, which is approximately seven years later, and he rules and reigns for a thousand years. Now, I want to talk about the first one. When he comes for the church, now, according to what the Word of God is going to be unexpected. You take the majority of the world today is not expecting Christ to return, are they? No, they're thinking about other things. But he said he's going to come back. And we know it's going to, it could be in, it could happen any time. Before this service is over, with, you and I could be in heaven with the Lord. My friends, it's going to be that fast. In the uh, word of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, it says, in the twinkle of an eye. They said a batten of an eye is approximately one sixteenth of a second, and twinkle of an eye is faster than that. That's how fast it's going to happen. My friend, as these men have already said this morning, I believe we're right at the door where that's going to take place. I believe most of you agree with me. Things that have happened in the last few years that I never thought would happen. And it's always shaping up. You take if the Antichrist is going to come on the scene, he's going to promise everything. You take you let a man like that come on the scene right now, wouldn't people fall in? Yeah, the people are hurting. This COVID virus, I believe that has hurt the church as much as anything I can think of. Driving over here, I've noticed a number of churches not, had, don't have the doors open. They're closed. In Floyd County, I know of three churches without a pastor right now. My friend, the devil's working overtime, you might say. My friend, I believe the rapture's about ready to take place. Amen? I believe it could happen any time. And I think we should realize this, and we should be working for it. Now, because of this, might return at any moment. We should be busy for him. Now in the text here, I believe there's four watches, and I believe each one represents a type of the coming of Christ. Notice it mentioned there's the evening, uh, an evening hour, the cock crowing in the morning. I skipped one. The evening, midnight, cock crowing in the morning. Now these, you notice, they're all at night. And I believe they represent that the coming of Christ is going to be secret. It's going to happen fast. Go with me over to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 37 38. This is what Christ said about the second coming of Christ, how it would be. Look what he says. Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 and 38. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the, shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days they were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah and into the ark. My friend, doesn't that describe our today's to that sound like a the morning newspaper? It's so much alike. What was it? There was indifference. There was indifference to the God. There's indifference to the word. And then there was just please and self. What's the attitude of the most people today? Please myself. 
Don't work matter what God says. Doesn't matter what he has to do. As long as I please myself. And that's what was going on today. Now, it was unexpected. And I think of the, of the coming of Christ that. G. Campbell Morgan, uh, some of you may have some of his books. He had in one of his biographies this. He said, I never begin my work in the morning without thinking that perhaps he may interrupt my work and begin his own. I am not looking for death. I am looking for him. You know, that's what we should be. My friends, the Lord's going to come. Amen. And I believe it's good. It could happen in time. It's unexpected. Now, I had an older brother that was in World War II. He was at D-Day. Well, after the war was over, he came home. Well, uh, the house that we lived in was off the main road about, oh, I'd say from here over to the shopping center or something like that. It was a good way. We knew he was coming, but we didn't know when. Well, that morning I got up and I was getting ready to go to school. And here he comes walking in. And the, what a day of rejoicing that was. I remember my mother let me stay home from school. We had a big meal and everything. My friends, the coming of the Lord is near. And it could happen any time. And we should be sick. The question I want all of us to ask myself, and you ask yourself, how will he find you when he returns? He's coming. We don't know when, but he's coming. And so we want to look at how he will find you and me when he comes and the other people in the world. Now, the first one I want to deal with is will he find a servant? Look at uh, in Mark chapter 13. Verses 34 and 35, you see this. How he was, for the Son of Man, as is a man that taketh a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh, at evening, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. He says, He's coming. We know that the Lord is going to come. We don't know when. But we are to be working for him. Christ uses another parable over in Luke chapter 19, very similar to this. In Luke chapter 19, verses 12 and 13, he said, Therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds, and said unto them, Occupy till I come. In other words, what is he saying? Be busy for the Lord. Be busy for your master. He's coming. And how shall he expect it? And you see in this uh, parable, you see he says, Use what God has given you. My friend, God wants you to use whatever he has given you, whatever opportunity. I have a sermon, missed opportunities. How many opportunities I look back over my life, I've missed that I could have witnessed for the Lord that I didn't. My friends, we are to be busy for the Lord when he returns. We are to expect him coming. Now, in Mark chapter 13, uh, where we was at, you see there are different duties that he lists here. First of all, to every man his work. Every man was assigned certain obligations and responsibilities. Every person had a job to do. If Bible Baptist is going to grow, it won't be because of one person, not one person. It's because everybody doing their part. Working for the Lord. Pulling their weight, so to speak. They were assigned a certain penalty. You notice here in the parable, he says a porter. He's the one that was probably the keeper of the house. The servants were probably the ones out in the field. And the power. But they had responsibilities. The Lord had assigned responsibility to everyone. Now, I've, as Brother David said, I've been around a long time. And I've been to a lot of different churches. And I've had a lot of people talk to me. And how many people have I had come up to me and say, Preacher, I'd love to do something for the Lord, but I don't have any talent. 
My friend, the Bible doesn't say that you have to have any talent. He said, if you're available, yeah, I'll, you, I'll give you the ability to do whatever you want you, he wants you to do. My friend, we ought to be busy for the Lord, every one of us. And then the Lord has assigned in our local church, there is the, uh, some are to preach, some are to teach, some are to work with the youth, some are to sing, musicians, all working together. Go with me over First Corinthians chapter 12. Look what, how Paul puts this, how that you and I are to work together. First Corinthians chapter 12, notice 12 through 14. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all members of that one body, being many, are one all one body, so also is Christ. For by, one, by the Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Why, that's a, he, this is talking about the local church. And every person doing their part is the way a local church grows. Is the Lord going to find me serving the Lord when he returns? Is he going to find people in this word of uh, to, Bible Baptist Church serving the Lord. Oh, is it so easy to not get off course? We the, the Bible expects us as believers to be obedient, expect him to come. He's got certain jobs for us. Now, when I was in Western Salem, pastor, I had a good friend, B.A. Carroll. He was a dear man. He grew up on a farm up at Danbury. And uh, he uh, was going into Winston-Salem, which was about 50 miles away. And he told, his dad told B.A., he said, now, B.A., I want you to go out and hoe the corn. Anybody remember when you hoed ho corn? I never could understand why you had to hoe in the middle of the road, you. But they, you had to hoe corn. He said, now, I want you to hoe that corn. B.A. said, I had the greatest intention of hoeing that corn. But some friends came around, and they said, now, they didn't live too far from the Dan River. He said, they said, come on, it won't, we won't be gone very long, and you can come back and hoe the corn. Well, he got down there, and they swimming, and they started uh, fishing, and the fish were biting, and before they know it, it was close to evening. He goes back home, and... He hadn't hoed the corn. His dad came in and said, B.A., hey, did you hoe the corn? He said, no. Back in those days, when you didn't do what your dad told you to do, you knew what was coming. He got it. But he said, you know, I had good intentions. And I believe a lot of people today, they have good intentions of serving the Lord, working for the Lord. But other things just comes along. They get busy of doing other things, there's so many things in their life that's going on that needs their attention. And we kind of put the Lord over to the side. You take a rich farmer. It wasn't anything wrong with him taking care of the crops. He should have. But why? He just forgot God. What's wrong with this country today? We've forgotten God, haven't we? We've pushed him out of our schools. We've pushed him out of our government. Then we want him to bless us. My friends... It's so easy, but we are as Christians are to be serving the Lord, Ben Grunt. I don't think Jimmy Jones ever been here at this church, but he used to come over to New Haven quite a bit. He pastored in West Virginia. And he said he had some Christians, he had some members in his church that were little Christians. They needed toil and a spin. They didn't do anything. I'm afraid every church is like that. You know, someone said you can do a great amount of work as long as it doesn't have to be done today. Doesn't that seem to be right? Uh, I have, any of you wives got a honey-do list for your husbands? It's so easy to tell your wife, well, I'll take care of that tomorrow, but then something else comes along, you get busy and you forget to do that. Don't you? I'm afraid that's what happens to us, to serving the Lord. Oh, so it's so easy just to kind of back up. When I was 
pastoring in North Carolina, I had a truck driver. He was gone a lot. He said, Preacher, when I get off the road, I'm going to be in church all the time. Well, he retired. You know what? I saw less of him after he was retired than I did when he was real working. I mean, it's just so easy to just kind of push it off to the side, not work for them. Billy Martin, so I don't know, he may have preached here, I'm not sure. Billy Martin, great man of God, he's 90 years old and he's having a lot of health problems right now, but he's still going. He said he had some Christians in his church, he had the philosophy, I shall not be moved. It seems like that. They don't not working for the Lord. I heard of a man. He was a lazy man. This man and somebody came along and he had an old building out there. They said, Why don't you tear that building down out there? He said, No, nah, I'll wait till lightning strikes it and it'll take care of it. And he said, Well, when are you gonna watch your watch uh, wash your pickup? He said, I'm not gonna wash it. I'm going to let the rain take care of it. Somebody look at my car and you probably think that's me. But anyway, it was time to dig your potatoes. And they said, are you going to dig your potatoes? He said, nah. I'm going to wait there. We have an earthquake and let the earth shake them out of the ground. I'm afraid some Christians are waiting for other people to do it, other things to do it instead of serving the Lord. But thank God for people like you that are here this morning that's willing to serve the Lord. I think what the testimony they had of Pastor Edder back here, being faithful to the Lord. I'm sure he got up this morning, it would have been a lot easier not to come to the house of the Lord, but he's here because he wants to be faithful to the Lord. He wants to serve the Lord. So the first one, will the Lord find you busy when he comes? Are you doing what God has called you to do? I'm sure you can think of members right here of Bible Baptists they're not serving the Lord. Many of you have been to this church a long time, and you could probably count many people that's come and started serving the Lord, but now you don't ever see them again. They just drop out. I heard of a couple that they had this son, and they've moved, and he was busy about his job, and she was busy about her job, and, a little, and they, so they had been, well, what I meant to start to say that they had been active in the church before they moved. But they got moved and they was busy moving and getting settled in and the job requiring a lot of times. A little boy ran out in the road, was hit by a car. And the man said, that was just something to wake me up because I knew I should have been back in serving the Lord, been in God's house but I just got busy and just kind of pushed it off to the side. Well, where do you find serve? Now let's look at the second group. That's a sleeping group. Notice back in our text in Mark chapter 13, verse 36. Lest he find you sleeping. Now the word sleeping here means uh, just uh, not concerned about spiritual matters. Not concerned about eternal matters. No, just lack of interest. Any, member, any of you remember the cartoon? I mean, the advertising used to be on television where these boys were sitting around the table and they had this new food and they didn't want to taste it. And they all said, let Mikey do it. You remember that advertising? Let Mikey do it. I'm afraid we have a lot of people in our churches. Let Mikey do it. Let somebody else do it. The sleep is lack of interest in things of God. I had a, uh, my oldest brother in World War II. My other brother was in the Korean War. He was stationed at Fort Pickett, and he'd come home a lot. And one day, uh, well, he'd, been, he'd come home on the weekends. One time he's been out, of course, and was driving back, and just got back in right before midnight when he had to go on duty. He put him on, they put him on guard duty. And he went out there and it was, you know these, it was a kind of a fall evening. You know these fall evenings where it's kind of cool and, and everything is quiet and he'd been awake on. He said before you know it, he was kind of dozing. It's kind of dozing. 
Guess who came around? The sergeant. My friends, what am I saying? I'm afraid we got a lot of Christians for our spirituality is sleeping. To go with me over to Romans chapter 13, verse 11, look what Paul says about this can be in concern about working for the Lord. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. And that knowing the time, that now is his high time to wake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. What's he saying? It's time to work. The Lord's are coming. The Lord's are coming. As David mentioned, we all got people that we know or friends and family that are not saved. What are we doing? What are we doing trying to get them to trust Christ as their Savior? Now, now go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, I mean 2 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6. Look what Paul says here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. In other words, be alert. Be busy by serving God. Jesus said that we should be interested in spiritual things. Jesus is saying that we should not be idle. We shouldn't be asleep. I guess you could say in our churches there are we have sleepwalkers. They're awake physical, but spiritually they're asleep. I'd like to read you a poem I think describes this condition pretty well. It goes like this. It's about the coming of Christ. Sometime, some ordinary day will come. A busy day like this, filled to the brim with ordinary tasks. Perhaps so full that we have little care or thought for him. And there will be no hint from silent skies, no sign, no clash of cymbals, roll of drummers, and yet the ordinary day will be the very day our Lord returns. O child of God, awake and work, and pray that the ordinary day might be today. Make ready all thy house, tomorrow's sun may never dawn upon the kingdom of God's son. What's he saying? We are to be busy serving God, working for the Lord. If Jesus come, is he going to find you serving of him? Or are you going to, is he going to you find you sleeping? How many here people at Bible Baptist Church will Christ find sleeping when he comes? Now to the third point. How will he find you ready? Well, in verse 37, back in our text, in verse 37, And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? If, if you definitely knew the Lord is going to come today, is there anything that you would change in your life? I need to ask myself that. We all need to ask ourselves that. We all need to be serving the Lord. Are you ready? Jesus is coming. I don't know when. But you look at the world situation. And just think. Uh, this coronavirus has popped up. It's, it's, I believe that has hurt a lot of churches. And it's, it's getting it set up where right now. The Antichrist can come on the scene without any problem. Now the first thing that a person. I think I'm probably. Talking, I'm not talking to anyone here, but I never know, but I always like to bring it out. The first step to be ready for his coming is to trust Christ as your personal Savior. I believe every one of you would probably say, yes, I've trusted Christ as my personal Savior. I, I've trusted him. I, I know that. I believe I'm going to heaven. But the second is, what are you doing for the Lord while you wait for the uh, master to return? Master's coming. And what are you doing in the meantime? Are we sleeping? I'm so thankful. As David was saying about how he heard about the gospel under Pastor Dehart. He was an outstanding preacher. I enjoyed talking to him. But anyway, I'm so thankful I heard the gospel of the man, Elbert Yates, came out to New Haven. 
held a revival. I heard the gospel, and I trusted Christ as my personal Savior back in 1954. I've been saved. I haven't always done the Lord's will in that length of time, but I was still a child of God. There was no question about that. But my question is to myself and to each one of us, are you ready for the coming of the Lord? If the Lord comes and just for 12 o'clock here, would you be ready for the Lord? Are you ready? Jesus is coming. I don't know when. But the Bible tells me, Murray, you have to be busy for me. You ought to be doing the work of the Lord. And he's saying the same thing to each one of you. You ought to be busy. You ought to be working for me. The question is, are we going to go in empty-handed before the Lord? Wouldn't it be wonderful at the judgment seat of Christ that someone pointed the finger at you or me and said, you know, because of that person living a life or maybe telling me about the Lord or inviting me to church, that I'm here in heaven with the Lord forever? Wouldn't that be great at the judgment seat of Christ? I'm thankful that somebody loved me enough to tell me about Christ. Aren't you glad that you, somebody told you about Christ today? Because if he had someone that hadn't took the time and effort, we know from the word of God I'd be on my way to hell. Christ is coming. What are we doing? Are we serving him? Are we having kind of gone to sleep and this kind of got involved in things in the world? Are you ready? The Lord's coming. I don't know when, but I know he's coming. Will you bow your heads? And if the music is uh, Sandra and the song leader get a song of invitation ready, I want to talk to you just a minute. Every head bowed and eyes closed. It's just between you and the Lord and me. Christian, at one time you was more excited about serving God than you are now. But you got so in bed, you know, things you've had, health problems, you've had this or that, or family problems, or a lot of churches, people have lost their jobs, and if, it can be anything. But you're not excited about serving God as you once was. And you say, preacher, I know I need to make some changes in my life. I need to refocus what I, how I'm going to live my life. And preacher, I want you to pray for me that I make these changes so I can be a better witness for the Lord. Would you sit your hand up and say, pray for me? Anyone anywhere, pray for me. I want you to pray for me. Now, is there someone here today? You're saved. You're going to heaven. But you know there's family members, there's friends, there's neighbors that's lost, what are we doing about it? Why are we living a life before them? Are we inviting them to church? Are we telling them about the Lord? You say, preacher, somebody's, somebody right now has been laid on my heart by the Holy Spirit that I need to pray for. I want you to pray for me that I'll pray for this person. Would you slip your hand and say, pray for them? Yes, yes. Anyone? Yes. Anyone else? Yes. Anyone else? Now, today is the day of salvation. If you've never trusted Christ, today is the day that you should. You won't find a better day than right now. Is there one in here that's never trusted Christ? Now, in just a moment, we're going to have a song of invitation. This is the invitation. You're here this morning, you're saved, but God has laid somebody on your heart that you need to pray for. You can pray for them back there, no question about that. But when the devil gets a hold of you this coming week and tries to tempt you to lead you from the Lord, it'll be more real. Or if you just want to talk to the Lord about something. If you want to talk to me, fine, but if you want to just pray about it, that's fine. I preached a message God laid on my heart. Now it's up to you what you do with that message.
Father, just bless this invitation. You saw the hands that was raised that they'd be more concerned about the loss. That they want to win that loss, loved ones. They know the time's running out. And Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit will make it real to each one of us that we should be busy serving God. Have you in this invitation? And if you're speaking to anyone to do anything, may they follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit today. Bless this invitation. And may your will be done. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Just